نرحب بالدكتور صادق قاسم وهو استاذ باحث وعالم في مجال علم الجينات وعلم المناعه ويعمل في شركه نوفارتس معهد نوفارتس وقبل كان يعمل في وزارة الصحة الأمريكية كذلك كباحث هذا من الجانب الأكاديمي أما من الجانب التبليغي فهو مبلغ معروف في الساحة الأمريكية ومؤسس لجمعيات إسلامية ومؤسسات إسلامية ويلقي محاضرات تربوية توعوية في الساحل الشرقي لأمريكا وفي ديربون فلوريدا ماسيسيوتيس فيلادلفيا، بنسلفانيا وكثير من المدن الاخرى ما اطول عليكم اطلب منكم الترحيب به بالصلاه على محمد وعلي محمد. اللهم صل على محمد وعلي محمد. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله لقد جاءت رسل ربنا بالحق ونوزوا أن تلكم الجنة ورثتموها بما كنتم تعملون والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيب قلوبنا السراج المنير المصطفى الأمجد أبا القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى ال بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المظلومين وعلى اصحاب القر الميامين السلام على الحسين السلام على العلي بن الحسين السلام على ال حسين السلام على اصحاب الحسين صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى يقول في القرآن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كرمنا بني آدم وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم على كثير ممن خلقنا تفضيلا صدق الله العلي العظيم <coughs> uh, question uh, pretty simple question what does it mean to be human uh, you may think this is a simple straightforward question you can answer this question from many uh, different perspectives but this is a question that people have asked from the very beginning of humanity. People have approached it from many different perspectives. You can approach the question, what does it mean to be a human, from the scientific perspective. You can say that being a human uh, means that you have genes or you have DNA that's uniquely human. However, the answer, or if you approach this question from the scientific perspective, it's actually very problematic. Because if you look at the human genome, or if you look at human genes, you'll find that humans share 95% of their genes with mice. So does that mean that the human is 95% mouse? Or does that mean that the mouse is 95% human? So if you approach it from a scientific perspective, it's pretty problematic. Now you can approach this from a political or an economic uh, perspective. The question of what does it mean to be a human has been answered by different philosophers and different political thinkers from the very beginning. So what we hope to answer here tonight is what does it mean to be a human and how does Karbala teach us how to be human, specifically through the example of Abbas, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa laqad karramna bani adama. And we have heightened or uh, elevated mankind. Wa laqad karramna bani adama. Wa hamalnahum fil barri wal bahr. Wa razaqnahum min al-tayyibat. Wa fadlalnahum من كثير من من على كثير من من خلقنا تفضيلا. Allah subhanahu wa taala is saying that we have elevated mankind. We've made them the highest of creation. Why is mankind the highest of creation? What differentiates mankind from animals? This is actually something that Imam Ali alayhi salam addressed one time. One time he saw an individual and he said about this individual: al-surat surat insan, wal-qalb qalb haywan. 
So he said, even though this person looks like a human, their mind and their heart is like that of an animal. Why did Imam Ali salam say that? Because simply having the physical uh, characteristics of a human does not make you a human. There are higher qualities that make one a human. And the highest quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted to mankind that makes mankind human, differentiates mankind from the uh, other creatures, is the quality of freedom or the quality of liberty. Imam Ali alayhi salam again says, Al-dunya daru mamar, la daru maqar, wal nasu fiha rajulan, rajulun ba'a nafsuh fiha fa'awbaqaha, wa rajulun abta'a nafsuh fa'a'taqaha. Imam Ali alayhi salam says there are two types of people in this world and that this world is a temporary existence. He says one type of person comes into this world and they become a slave to this world. This is one type of person. They come into here, they sell themselves for a few dollars or for a few uh, material pleasures and they become slaves of this world. Another type of person is a uh, person who comes into this world and earns their freedom. So according to Imam Ali alayhi salam and according to the Quran and according to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet, the highest quality of being a human is equated to the quality of liberty, of freedom. And in fact, Imam Hussein alayhi salam in the battle of Karbala, when he fought against the enemies, his main position or his main principle was the uh, quality of freedom. Imam Hussein, when he was talking to the other side, said to the enemies, "In lam yakun lakum deen, fakunu ahraran fi dunyakum." If you don't have religion, then at the very minimum, you should be free people in this world. So Imam Hussein alayhi salam came down to teach people how to become free, to teach people how to become uh, people that uh, pursue liberty. So tonight's uh, talk will be div divided into two fundamental parts. In the first part, we're going to address the question, what does it mean to be free? We're going to approach this from two perspectives, from the Western classical perspective and from the Islamic perspective. So in the first part, we're going to define the concept of freedom. What does it mean to be a free individual? In the second part, we're going to go through the practical steps that the Prophet and that the Imams have taught us to become free individuals. And we're going to discuss this within the context of Karbala. Talk about how Karbala teaches us to be free individuals, both in our daily lives uh, and in our, uh, in our uh, personal lives and in our uh, social lives. Salawat. So what does, uh, what does uh, freedom or liberty mean? The uh, Western philosophers have approached this from, the, uh, from two schools of thought. Uh, there's a uh, famous uh, essay by a uh, Western philosopher named Isaiah Berlin, and he divides liberty into two schools of thought. There's the school of negative liberty, and there's the school of positive liberty. What does the school of negative liberty mean, and what does the school of positive liberty mean? The school of negative liberty is best epitomized or represented by people like John Locke and Adam Smith. Adam Smith is the founder of modern-day capitalism. What does the school of negative liberty say? It says that to be a free individual, you have to create a society that has minimal amount of rules. Uh, the school of negative liberty believes that rules are bad and they prevent people from pursuing their maximal happiness. So in a society that, for example, prevents you from building your house in such a way, or in a society that prevents you from buying a gun, or in a society that prevents you from doing what you like, the, the school of negative liberty says that's not a free society. So the school of negative liberty says rules are bad. The school of positive liberty, on, uh, by contrast, which is epitomized by people like Rousseau and Karl Marx, says that no, in a free society, you need to create many rules. You need to create an environment where people are essentially equal with each other or can pursue opportunities at an equal stance. So for example, in a society that believes in positive liberty, uh, the society would create an environment where uh, education is free, where health is free, where people have many rules, where the society has many rules to prevent people from uh, hurting each other and from causing harm to each other. That's the school of positive liberty. So we have the negative liberty, which says essentially rules are bad, positive liberty that says rules are good. Now what's the problem with these two de definitions? These two definitions define liberty by mankind's ability to do. 
Meaning your ability to be free is related to your ability to either do or not do certain things. Islam, however, comes at the issue of liberty, not only from the material perspective, but from the spiritual perspective. Islam uh, says that there's more to your existence than just this uh, material world, that there's a spiritual essence that you need to liberate. liberate. And we'll talk about this in more detail, but please give me a loud salawat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Faqim wajhaka lil-deeni hanifa, Fatrat Allah allati fatara al-nasa alayha, La tabdila li khalqillah, Thalika al-deenu al-qayim, Walakin akthar al-nasi la ya'lamun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Allah has created mankind in a certain condition, and that condition is called fitra. And the nat natural state of uh, fitra is to be free. But what does it mean to be free from the Islamic perspective? And again, this is an important question because you'll notice that in mankind's essence, humans all over the world, irrespective of whether they're white, black, African, uh, European, Asian, all humans aspire towards freedom. You look at societies, what do they build monuments to? They build monuments to freedom. In New York City, for example, they have a statue called the Statue of Liberty. In Philadelphia, they have something called the Liberty Bell, which is a bell that represents freedom. In Iran, they have a uh, tower that's called Burj Azad, or the Tower of Freedom. People all over the world, irrespective of their background, aspire towards freedom. And in fact, the Sumerians, archaeologists tell us that the first word that the Sumerians or Samurian wrote when they came up with uh, the uh, handwriting is the word Amari, which is roughly tr translated to freedom or liberty. So mankind in its essence wants to be free. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us. The fitra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, uh, is the uh, natural condition of uh, mankind and that's the condition to want to be free. So what does it mean to be free from the Islamic perspective? Well actually the best definition comes from Surah Al-Imran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he tells the Prophet, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَنْ لَا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَا نُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُنَا بَعْضًا أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ فَإِنْ تَوَلَّوْا فَقُلْ وَأَشْهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ let me break this ayah down into its individual parts. The definition of freedom is best defined by this ayah. What does this ayah say? Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Qul, say. Say to who? Whenever you're talking to someone, you have to address a particular audience. So who's the Prophet addressing to? Uh, addressing here? He's addressing the people of the book. Qul, Ya Ahl al-Kitab. Say what to the people of the book? The people of the book being the Christians, the Jews, and all other people that received their revealed religion. Say what? What's Allah telling the Prophet to tell to the people? قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Come, let us unite under a united umbrella. Let us come together under a united umbrella, under a common word. Let us unite on a common word. قُلْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ What's that common word? That we worship none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we don't associate any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we don't take as protectors or as masters anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they turn away, Say, I bear witness that we are the Muslims. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying here? He's saying that the common word is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to become a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you become free of everything else. Think about that. When you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you become independent and you become a free individual of everything else that's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about that. If you worship, for example, money, then your master or your, uh, or your uh, creator becomes the one who holds that money. If you worship uh, prestige, then the one who becomes your master is the one who gives you prestige. If you worship wealth and, and land, then the one who becomes your master is the one who possesses that wealth or the land. However, when you worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
then you become dependent on Allah and independent of, of everything else. That's why Imam Ali السلام, says, Al-Tama' Greed is perpetual slavery. If you, if you become greedy for the sake of material comfort, not saying that material comfort is bad, but if that becomes your modus operandi or your way of functioning, then your master becomes the one who controls your material comfort. It's either your boss who controls the paycheck, it's either your teacher who controls your grades, it's either society which controls your status in society. So you don't have to be a slave to only material things. Sometimes, oftentimes, we're a slave to social uh, pressures. So we think that in order to be uh, accommodating or in order to incorporate ourselves into society, we need to get the acceptance of people in society. This is a type of slavery as well, when you're depending on the, uh, on the uh, uh, acceptance of uh, other people. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, first, the most common aspect of freedom according to Islam, that if you want to be a free indiv individual, you have to direct yourself and direct your uh, condition towards the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you worship Allah, you become independent of everything else. What's the second part? And that we associate no partners with Him. We can get into this in, in, in a, another night, this part of uh, shirk. But then the third part Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about is That we take no masters other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does this mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you want to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't have to depend on the priest or on the uh, clergyman. So you have in other faiths, for example, like I'll give you the example of the Catholic faith. They have something called confession. What is confession? Confession is when you commit sin, you go into a, a church, you talk to a, a priest, and you tell your priest or you admit to the priest your sins. And then the uh, priest will forgive your sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you don't need a man of the cloth to forgive your sins. Why are you depending on an individual when you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the third part is what I attached to the Bible and 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 the Bible so let's go into the practical ways of how we can achieve freedom after a loud salawat. In Surah Al Jum'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the uh, three steps that enable an individual to become free, or how the Prophet enabled society to become free. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah Al-Jum'ah? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Huwa al-ladhi ba'atha fi al-ummiyyina rasoolan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatih wa yuzakihim wa yu'allimahum al-kitaba wal-hikmata wa in kanu min qablu lafi dalal mubin The way that the Prophet enabled the society to achieve freedom is articulated in this ayat. Three easy steps that will enable you to become free individuals. What's the first step? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Huwa alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyyina rasoolan minhum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a messenger from among the ignorant people. Rasoolan minhum. How did the Prophet enable the people of jahli or ignorance to achieve freedom? First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yatlu alayhim ayatin. The first step towards achieving freedom depends on this book right here, this Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the way that society uh, during the time of the Prophet came out of darkness was by listening to the verses that were recited by the Prophet sallallahu Now, I want to spend some time talking about the Qur'an and how we should approach the Qur'an to enable us to become free. Many of us think we're reading the Qur'an, but the reality is uh, very few of us are actually reading the Qur'an as the Prophet intended us to read the Qur'an. Meaning what? Meaning the Prophet ﷺ has told us how to read the Qur'an. The Prophet says 
اقرأوا القرآن ما اختلفت عليه قلوبكم ولنت عليه جلودكم وإن اختلفتم فلستم تقرؤونه. The Prophet says, read the Quran in such a way that it enables your heart to be touched. اقرأوا القرآن ما اختلفت عليه قلوبكم meaning in such a way that your heart connects with the Quran. ولنت عليه جلودكم and that your skin becomes softened by what you hear. Meaning, you should be reading the Qur'an uh, and approaching the Qur'an as a book of inspiration. Whenever you're reading the Qur'an, you're not approaching the Qur'an to see how many ayahs you can read. Many of us during the month of Ramadan, we read, we do the khatma of the Qur'an. And then by the end of Ramadan, we say we've completed the Qur'an. But how much of that Qur'an has actually touched us? The Prophet says, اقرأوا القرآن ما اتلفت عليه قلوبكم Read the Qur'an in such a way that it connects with your heart. If it only takes one ayah for you to connect with the Qur'an, read only one ayah. If it only takes ten ayahs to, read, to connect to the Qur'an, read ten ayahs. But approach the Qur'an not as a book of information, but rather as a book of inspiration. What does that mean? What's the difference? Information, you can get information from your textbook or from your regular book, from Wikipedia, for example. Wikipedia is a site that gives you information. Uh, the Qur'an is something that gives you inspiration, meaning it teaches you uh, to, to uh, be inspired. In the Qur'an, it's a book of hidayah, it's a book of guidance. It's supposed to make you a better person. If you're reading the Qur'an and it's making you a worse person, then you're actually not reading the Qur'an. You're just like the people of ancient who have the scriptures but they were not affected by the Qur'an. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The Qur'an was revealed in such a way that it could touch and affect the people that were living during the time of Jahiliyyah. You'll notice the way that the Qur'an was revealed. The Qur'an was revealed not in one uh, time. So, the, you know, not 114 surahs were revealed at one time, but it was piecemeal. Maybe three ayahs here, one ayah here, two ayahs here. The Qur'an was revealed in a uh, piecewise uh, manner. And this was done in an intentional way to affect the people and to inspire the change. Now I wanted to uh, mention one more thing about the Qur'an. Many of us take the Qur'an for granted, but in fact this is the greatest miracle that has been given to all of humanity. Salawat. <laughs> Meaning what? Meaning, let's compare and contrast the Qur'an to uh, another uh, book, uh, the Bible. There's, a, uh, there's an interesting uh, author, his name is uh, Bart Ehrman, E-H-R-M-A-N. Bart Ehrman used to be a priest, he used to be a uh, Protestant priest. He went into the seminary school, and then afterwards he earned his PhD, and now he's a professor at Duke University. Bart Ehrman has written a fantastic book called Lost Christianities. Lost Christianities. What does he mention in this book? Bart Ehrman tells us in this book, and I was blown away by this statistic, but he tells us about the different number of copies of the New Testament that there are currently. Uh, so actually, uh, before we proceed, let me ask uh, people of the audience, how many different copies of the Bible do you think there are out there? Five? Okay, five different copies maybe, five different versions. Any other guesses? Four? More? Okay, more. Well, according to Bart Ehrman, he says that there are 5,400 different copies of the Bible. Now, you may say there are small differences between these different copies of the Bible. Bart Ehrman has actually gone into the detail to examine how many differences there are. Maybe you're thinking, oh, there's small changes here and there. Uh, so uh, what Bart Ehrman uh, says, and I'm going to quote here, he says, we find that no two of these copies agree in their wording, meaning he's tried to find copies that look similar, but they're completely different. How many differences are there between these 5,000 different copies? He says no one really knows. Some people say that there are around 200,000 differences between these copies. Some people say there are around 300 different uh, 300,000 differences between the copies but he goes on to say perhaps it is simplest to express the figure in comparative terms there are more differences among our manuscripts 
than there are actual words in the New Testament. Think about that. If the New Testament is 150,000 words, he's saying there are over 200,000 differences between them. Now, by contrast, this Qur'an, how many differences are there between the Qur'an? If we go here, and if we go to uh, al Khoi Center, and if we go to uh, a masjid in Uzbekistan, and if we go to a masjid in Turkey, and if we go to a masjid in uh, Riyadh, and if we go to a masjid in Tehran, how many different copies will we find? One. This is the only book that we know of in human history that has preserved its integrity from day one that has not been changed or altered in any physical uh, shape or form. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, When the Prophet is reciting the ayahs of the Qur'an, they're supposed to touch us in such a way that we're affected, that they touch our heart. Not simply reading for quantity, but reading for uh, quality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ If this mountain had been revealed, if this uh, Qur'an had been revealed on a mountain, you would see the mountain humbled and, and bow down to the Qur'an. So if this Qur'an was revealed on Mount Tromblon, for example, you would see that the entire mountain would perish just in terms of bowing to the Qur'an. So if a mountain is going to be affected to this regard by the Qur'an, what excuse do we have? So as I said, the first principle that enables us to achieve liberty and freedom is as articulated by the Prophet, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ When we recite the verses of the Qur'an, they're supposed to touch us in such a way that we get affected on both a physical, a spiritual, and a mental level. And we'll go into more details about this uh, later on. We'll go tomorrow into uh, steps two and steps three of how to achieve freedom. So just to summarize, Freedom is a universal uh, emotion, or it's a universal uh, need for all of humans. Uh, there are two schools of thought in Western uh, civilization, school of negative liberty, school of positive liberty. Islam is different from those in that it defines liberty according to the spiritual self. Because if you're not free on a spiritual level, you'll never be free on a physical level. So freedom is dependent not on the, on the material self, not on the jasad, but the freedom is dependent on your nafs, your spiritual self. The first step to achieve freedom is to recite the Qur'an and to approach the Qur'an as a book of inspiration. So this is the first step tomorrow and, uh, and the day after, inshallah, we'll go over uh, steps two and three. Uh, which are uh, هو الذي بعث في الأمين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين. So it is he who uh, reveals the uh, to the uh, Ummis, the uh, the Prophet. Uh, he recites to them the ayahs, and we'll go over steps two and three uh, tomorrow. But getting back to our topic, how does Karbala teach us about the concept of freedom? When we look at the companions of the uh, Imam. And when we look at the Imam himself, we notice that every single one of them was spiritually free. There were individuals who sacrificed their own material comfort, who sacrificed their own physical comfort for the sake of a higher cause. They were not slaves to this dunya, but rather they were slaves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Hussein again says, In lam yakun lakum deen, fakunu ahraran fi dunyakum. If you don't have religion, at the very least be free people in this world. And one of the freest individuals is his brother, Abbas alayhi salam. Tonight we'll talk briefly about Abbas alayhi salam, and uh, inshallah tomorrow we'll go uh, over the others. Give me a lot, salawat. So on the uh, 10th of uh, Ashura, uh, the entire companions and, and the family and the friends of the Imam were all massacred one by one. The last one remaining was Abbas alayhi salam. And Abbas wanted to repeatedly go out onto the battlefield. So he goes to the Imam Hussein alayhi salam and he says, please let me go out and let me fight, let me participate with you. Imam Hussein alayhi salam says, I can't let you go. Because you're my alamdar, you're the one who's carrying the uh, flag of my uh, cause. And Abbas alayhi salam begs and pleads and eventually Imam Hussein says, fine, uh, fetch some water 
for these uh, crying children. These children are crying. They need some help. They need some support. At the very least, I don't want you to fight, but I want you to go out and get some water for these uh, children. Abbas alayhi salam goes out to the Euphrates River and immediately he's surrounded by the opposing forces, hundreds if not thousands of enemies. They see him. He's carrying the water, filling his water skin. And as soon as he finishes filling the water skin, they start to, to uh, shoot him with arrows and they cut off his left arm. And Abbas alayhi salam, alayhi salam says, Wallah, in qata'tum yamini, inni uhami abadan an dini. By Allah, even if you cut off my right hand, I will still remain the defender of Allah's religion. And he goes on to say, وَعَنْ إِمَامِ صَادِقِ الْيَقِينِ نَجْلِ النَّبِيِّ الطَّاهِرِ الْأَمِينِ And supporter of the Imam who's truthful in belief, the Prophet's son, the impeccable and the trustworthy. He's reciting these uh, couplets of poetry <laughs> in, in, uh, in the uh, face of adversity. And the uh, opposing side, do they have mercy? Do they enable, do they have rahmah for Abbas alayhi salam? No, they go on to cut off his left hand. And irrespective of this, Abbas alayhi salam goes on to say, Ya nafsu, la tafshi min al-kuffar, wa abshiri bi rahmati al-jabbar, ma'a al-nabi al-sayyid al-mukhtar, qad qata'u bi ba'ihim ya sari, fa aslihim ya rabbi har al-nari. Abbas goes on to say, Oh myself, don't be scared of the non-believers. Notice here, Abbas, right hand chopped off, left hand chopped off, still say, saying to himself, Don't be a slave to these people. These people don't control your faith. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that controls your faith. And be happy of Allah's reward and blessing, together with the holy prophet chosen by Allah. Now they have cut off my left hand with cruelty, O oh Allah. Let them burn inside the blazing fire. And so here we have Abbas, the beloved brother of the uh, Imam. Right hand chopped off, left hand chopped off. Do they have mercy? Do they have rahmah? No, still no. They shoot him with arrows. So one of the arrows pierces the eye of Abbas alayhi salam. Imam Hussein sees this and he can't take this any longer. It's his beloved brother Abbas, the one who supported him throughout this entire journey. And eventually Abbas falls down and he bleeds to death in the Euphrates River. Imam Hussein goes and tries to pick up the dead body of, of Abbas and he's crying. He's seeing his brother. This is the brother that he's grown up with. This is the brother that he's played with. This is the brother that he shared good times and bad times with. He sees his brother and he's crying. His beard is filled with tears. And he says, Akhi, ya nura aini, ya shaqiqi, O oh brother, the light of my eyes and part of my body. Think of your brother. Think of your sister. Think what would happen if you saw them in such a state. Imam Hussein witnessed the state many times over. And he goes on to say, Your presence was like a firm and robust shelter for me. Imagine Imam Hussein telling his brother, You're the one that I depended on. You're like this column that I see here in the middle of the masjid. And he goes on to say, Oh son of my father, you fought sincerely until you quenched my uh, thirst with a drink from this heavenly cup. So here the Imam is referring to Abbas as the Qamar or the Qamar of Bani Hashim, the moon of the clan of Bani Hashim. He's saying, oh my bright moon, you are my best supporter. <coughs> During all these terrible hardships and tragedies. Think, what would you do if you saw your beloved brother or your beloved sister that supported you through all these tragedies, being in such a state? And then the Imam goes on to say, And tomorrow we are going, and after you life is bitter and hard for me indeed. Uh, tomorrow we are going to be beside each other. So even though this moment right now is difficult for me, tomorrow we'll be gathered together with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala lillah shakwai wa sabri wa ma alqahu min lamma'in wa dhiqi. Know that I complain only to Allah and remain patient and seek refuge in Him in facing this thirst and hardship. So we would say that in this condition, Abbas alayhi salam and the Imam represents the highest ideals of, of humanity, the highest ideals of freedom. What does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be human? You have the living embodiment of humanity right here. 
Humanity is not simply having the physical form of a human, but rather it's having the spirit of sacrifice of the human, the spirit of Abbas alayhi salam and the spirit of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us free individuals, both in this world and in the hereafter. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us like Abbas alayhi salam and like Imam Hussein and like Zainab and like Al-Hur, and like all the other companions of the uh, Imam, and like all of the Imams, uh, from Imam Ali alayhi salam, all the way to Al-Hujjat Al-Qa'im, uh, Ajal Allah Faraja. Rabbana la tu'akhadna al nasina wa akhba'na, Rabbana wa la tahmil alayna aswan kama hamalta wa ala al-ladhina min qablina, Rabbana wa la tu'akhadna ma la ta'akhta lana, bih wa'afu anna wa akhfir lana wa alhamna, anta maulana fansuna ala al-qawm al-kafirin, salawat. Thank you very much, Dr. Sadiq. We thank him again because he arrived just an hour before he comes here from uh, a long drive from Boston right to uh, Montreal and we didn't give him any rest. He came right away to lecture. So inshallah tomorrow and the day after we will host him again at 7.30. Please try to be earlier and he will continue his series of lectures. Again, it's Dr. Sadiq Qasim from Boston. He's a scientist in uh, immunology and uh, gene therapy, and he works in Novartis Institute in the States. Thank you very much. Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad.